preparing to live stream. Okay, I've got it up on the screen, so. Just have to make sure it's muted. Okay. Good to see you, Dean. Hello, whoever that is. Good to see you, although I don't see you. I hope you see some lyrics. It is 1059, and we're getting started. Charlie, do you see those lyrics up there? Uh, yeah, I'm actually on the other page. I did see them quickly, but I know. Okay. Yeah. 11 a.m. on a Sunday and good morning. Welcome to Community Church. We're glad to have you. We're just really excited about this morning's event. Die Gedanken sind frei, my thoughts freely flower. Die Gedanken sind frei, my thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them, no hunter can trap them, no one can deny. Die Gedanken sind frei. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to duke or dictator. No one can deny the Gedankens in Frei. And if tyrants take me and throw me in prison, my thoughts will break free like blossoms in season. Foundations will crumble, the structure will tumble, and freedom will cry. in fry. Foundations will crumble, the structure will tumble, and freedom will cry. And freedom will cry, the Gedanken sind frei. That was one of the songs that Julius Rosenberg goosebumps. sang in prison, Dean. Hey, 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 hello. I get goosebumps Oops. every time I sing that song. Yeah. Good morning, folks. My name is Dean Stevens. I'm a longtime member of Community Church, and it has been my pleasure and honor to facilitate these Zoom meetings during the last 14 months. Uh, and it's been a full, a full schedule of just wonderful things, and it's not over yet, but we're getting there. Uh, folks, um, I want to tell you about a couple of things, and I'm going to be brief because we have a wonderful guest that we haven't heard from in five or six years, Jen Mirapol. Um, I want to say the first thing is that on the way in here, thinking about Die Gedanken sind frei, yeah. that <laughs> I was reminded of another song about thoughts. Thoughts are free is what Die Gedanken sind frei means. The, the other song yeah. is um, by the famous uh, New York comedic songwriter, Christine Lavin. And her song is called, I'm a prisoner of my stupid thoughts, <laughs> which is more what I think about during my day than, than lofty thoughts like my thoughts are free and they will free me and they will liberate our people. Uh, so I just had to get that out of the way before I light our candle. If there is someone in our congregation or in our midst who would like to remember 
someone who is past or remember someone who is in need of thoughts and prayers all the people of Palestine, says uh, Carolyn. All the people of Syria. Our board member, Ed Pazanese, who's just coming back from the hospital. Our planet. I'm going to start with. Um, words of, of our founder, Clarence Skinner, he says, out of the world's wide ways we come to this, our house of fellowship and aspiration. Mm. Here, may the evils which beset us be banished by the power of justice, the fears that haunt us be overcome by fresh insight, the doubts that drive us be dissolved into finer faith. Here, each in our own way, yet together, let us for a brief time look into the mysteries of life's beginning, the source out of which the endless eons roll and countless lives emerge and with renewed hope search through this maddening maze of things to find again life's aims and meaning and above all its glory. Clarence Skinner, founder of Community Church 101 years ago. I'm going to go on to the next reading and then have a couple announcements and um, and a song, and then we will get on with Jen. Um, this is uh, from a book called Eduardo Galeano, Children of the Days. Uruguayan uh, author, uh, favorite of mine. Um, and this is, he loved to write in uh, one or two paragraph vignettes. And this is one for each day of the year. And this is today's, it's called Atahualpa's Revenge. The town of Tambo Grande slept on a bed of gold. Gold lay under the houses unbeknownst to anyone. The news arrived along with the eviction orders. The Peruvian government had sold the entire town to Manhattan Minerals Corporation. Now you will all be millionaires, they were told, but no one obeyed. On this day in the year 2002, the result of a plebiscite was announced. The inhabitants of Tambo Grande had decided to continue living from avocados, mangoes, limes, and other fruits of the land they had worked so hard to wrest from the desert. Well, they knew that gold curses the places it inhabits. It blows apart the hills with dynamite and poisons the rivers with tailings that contain more cyanide than blessed holy water. Maybe they also knew that gold makes people crazy. Because with gold, the more you eat, the hungrier you get. In 1950, I'm sorry, in 1533, the Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro ordered Atahualpa strangled, even though the king of Peru had given him all the gold he demanded. A couple of announcements. We're winding up our season. We have two more Sundays. Next Sunday is um, a group of journalists from several countries in Central America. Together, they uh, uh, do a podcast. It's called Central American News, which is a sum up in 10 minutes of news from, uh, from every country that they can gather. And it's a really wonderful podcast. If you're interested in Central America, I recommend it. And um, the week after that, very amazing last minute um, uh, uh, booking Stephen Donziger. Stephen Donziger uh, spent 10 years uh, putting together a class action suit against Chevron for the, the way they polluted the Ecuadorian rainforest while they were drilling oil there. And um, uh, in turn, upon winning an enormous lawsuit for the, the people of, of those towns in the Amazon, Donziger has been um, persecuted and privately prosecuted by an army of lawyers hired by Chevron at endless expense to, to do what they could with him. And they found a, a, a 
a lawyer who had been a Chevron lobbyist, and they found a, a way to have a private prosecution against him, and it got him disbarred, and it got him uh, tried uh, for a misdemeanor. During, while the uh, trial is happening, he's um, sitting in his apartment and house arrest with, uh, with a bracelet on his ankle. It's, it's a horrible situation um, that you've probably heard of because it's got an, a lot of press, and Stephen is going to join us on June 20th. Now, the, the most exciting news I will tell you about, and I hope you can join us uh, because this is truly last minute. Our board has come together and unanimously voted to uh, award Julian Assange with the uh, Sacco Vanzetti Award. Okay. It's happening this Wednesday. This Wednesday, uh, when Julian's father and brother, John and Gabriel, Oh, their last name is, is, is escaping me now, um, from Australia are in Boston on a, a tour um, to promote Julian's freedom. Um, and we will take that opportunity to uh, award Julian our 2021 Sacco and Vanzetti Award. I hope you can all join us either virtually or physically. We feel safe to invite you to come into our newly air-conditioned auditorium, the Donald Lothrop Auditorium, and have some time with Julian and Gabriel Shipton. Uh, I'm sorry, John and Gabriel Shipton, the son and father of Julian Assange. Uh, it'll be a, a, a handing over of, of the award a ceremony, as well as a, uh, a, an interview with them by our, our cohorts at Mass Peace Action. It should be just a marvelous event. At three o'clock, Wednesday, June 9th. And join us on, online if you can't be here physically. It's at that, this very same link that you, are, um, uh, you have joined this morning. It's our, our church uh, Sunday morning link. Julian Assange. Is there anything else besides a song before we introduce Jen? Die Gedanken sind frei, and it sounds like Leonard Lerman has some, uh, some little history about that song that he wants to tell us about. Um, after, after we hear from Jen, It'd be really great to hear. That song has a, a, an amazing history. If you'll check uh, in Wikipedia, there, I won't bother you with it now because I have a different song, which has also become sort of an anthem for community church. This is a, a retelling of a movement song in a, in a more kind of a folk idiom. Uh, this is the work of Jim Infantino, a Boston songwriter. This song is called International, and we do it all the time here at community church. Rise up, you lonely wanderers. Rise up, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming. The land will soon be flooded. The past is dead and over. Rise up and claim your freedom. You are the sleeping giant. Arise, arise, arise. Do not beg for your salvation from people, preachers, kings, and masters. The people hold the power. Arise and claim your freedom. The wealthy enjoy privilege only at your acquiescence, only while you stay in darkness. Arise, arise, arise. Because in the end, freedom will be international. While politicos divide us, they demand their compensation. They should pray we don't refuse them. Arise and claim your freedom. The wealthy and the powerful, they are only human beings. On earth we are all equal. Arise, arise, arise. While all of us were sleeping, 
The bank owners got richer at the expense of all our children. Arise and claim your freedom. They are frightened by our numbers and by our interdependence, and rightfully they should be. Arise, arise, arise. Because in the end, Do not numb yourself with purchases or vain overconsumption. Do not isolate your spirit. Arise and claim your freedom. Your TV and your iPhone seek to keep you in your slumber. Step out into the sunlight. Arise, 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 rise up, you lonely wanderers. Rise up, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming. The land will soon be flooded. The past is dead and over. Rise up and claim your freedom. You are the sleeping giant. Arise, arise, arise. Because in the end, freedom will be. Because in the end, freedom will be international. We are surrounded in this room by history. Behind me, you can see a really amazing, beautiful plaque. It is a tribute to Sacco and Vanzetti, the um, two immigrant Italian anarchists who you know about. Um, uh, but it's just this reminder of history of the case we were uh, especially reminded of that in the last couple of months after the passing of Bob Dattilio, who is probably the world's foremost mm -hmm. authority on Sacco and Vanzetti. To my left here, we have a little bit of history of the last year, the, uh, the protests for Black Lives Matter. That's a beautiful uh, piece of work done by our own Crystal Rollins Jackson, our office manager and publications manager. She's just such a gifted artist and, um, and uh, graphic designer. Um, everywhere, history surrounds us and we have uh, archives, 101 now years worth of archives that speak to that history. Um, they're pretty disorganized and we're trying to take a stab at um, getting them together and organized in a way that's accessible to, to people either in a re repository or else here. It's, it's really a treasure up there. We have 50 years worth of cassette recordings of speakers, Cesar Chavez, Rosa Parks. Uh, that's just the, the very beginning. Um, some of the, the, the winners of our Sacco and Vanzetti Award um, uh, like William Kunstler, like Kathy Kelly, Medea Benjamin, most recently Daniel Ellsberg this, this last December. And we're hoping that Dan will be on our call, on our Zoom on Wednesday with, uh, with our, for, for Julian Assange. Um, we just uh, sent him an email, Ray McGovern and I. Um, so uh, we're laden with history. Another little piece of history I want to tell you about is something I found in the archives where Donald Lothrop in 1952 um, put out uh, an enormous petition mailing to every clergy, Christian, Catholic, or Jewish in all of New England and upstate New York, a petition to save the Rosenbergs. And um, 
In that folder is also a um, postcards and letters that came in, in response to that petition. And most of them were, were very positive and, and thank you. And, um, and there were two or three that were not so positive at all, um, which uh, are kind of like the chat on, on, on the YouTube channel or, or something. You know, it's just like there's got to be that little, little bit in there. But anyway, it reminds me of how we've, we've been connected with the Rosenberg case from when it happened. And um, I say that because generally, um, at this time of the year, to commemorate the anniversary of their execution, we put together a program. We have not in the last uh, four or five years, but here we are, and it's just a um, uh, incredible honor to. Um, I want to tell you another little story that one of our longest time members, um, whose name Shanti Renfrew, tells a story about when he was seven years old or so, being in Copley Square right in front of here for a, in a demonstration right in front of of the church at the building we had recently acquired just three four years before. Uh, demonstration to to save the the Rosenbergs. There's a lot more um, references to them in in our wealth of archives, but um, I just say that to uh, to say that it's just a pleasure for us to have Jen Mirapol with us and share some thoughts on on what the Rosenberg Fund for Children is up to lately. That's just uh, I have to say just such a beautiful way to turn tragedy and grieving into uh, the most beautiful uh, support for, for children. It's, it's just, I can't think of, of a more perfect way to, to do it. That's my introduction. Jen Mirapol, thank you for being with us. You can find out more about her, her CV on our YouTube channel. This, uh, this will be recorded, by the way, and you can tell your friends to, to go to our YouTube uh, channel where you can find uh, a wealth of, of uh, programs from the last year and two months when we started March of 2020. So let's, let's have a round of virtual applause for Jen Mirapol. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Dean, and everyone at the Community Church of Boston for inviting me here today and for holding this annual commemoration for my grandparents, which you've reinstituted. Um, I also just want to thank everyone for joining us this morning and a special congratulations to the Community Church of Boston on your 100th season. That's very impressive. So as Dean said, my name is Jennifer Ethel Rose Mir Mirapol. Sorry, I'm Robert Mirapol's older daughter and Ethel and Julius Rosenberg's granddaughter. And I joined the staff of the Rosenberg Fund for Children in July of 2007, um, and then became the RFC's second executive director when my father retired from that role in the fall of 2013. So the Rosenberg Fund for Children, we provide for the educational and emotional needs of children of targeted progressive activists in the United States. So that means that we make grants for kids whose parents have struggled against police brutality and white supremacy, for economic justice and labor rights, international human rights, free speech and free press issues, LGBTQ equality and reproductive rights, freedom for all political prisoners, civil rights, and a variety of peace and anti-war efforts. We also provide support to young people who have been targeted because and faced repression because of their own organizing. So as Dean mentioned, I spoke at this commemoration in, I think in 2014 and 2011. Uh, my first talk really focused on my family history the work of the Rosenberg Fund for Children, which my dad likes to describe as his constructive revenge, that the, his way of transforming the pain and suffering that was visited on his family into something positive for children experiencing similar targeting today. In 2014, 
I was really thinking about the upcoming centennial of my grandmother, um, Ethel. Her 100th birthday would have been September 28th, 2015. And that was the same month as the RFC's 25th anniversary. So those joint anniversaries really had me thinking about my grandmother, how she was represented and understood in her own time, and what questions or lessons that understanding could raise both for us today and certainly for all of us at the RFC in thinking about our work with today's targeted activists and their kids. More than five years later, I'm grateful to be back with all of you. Um, at the RFC, we celebrated in a muted, weirdly COVID way, the RFC's 30th anniversary this past year. And most relevant for what I really wanna talk with all of you about this morning, we're also several years removed from the RFC's campaign to exonerate my grandmother. And so that's what I wanna talk about is what drove us to petition President Obama to exonerate Ethel, what we hope to accomplish, our successes, our failures, and what we learned from that campaign that might influence future efforts. So let me start off just saying a very few words about my grandparents' case. Um, in 1950, when my dad was three and his father was three years old, his father, Julius, was arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit espionage. A few weeks later, his mother, Ethel, was arrested on the same charges. They were tried and convicted. And when my dad was six and his older brother was 10, both their parents were executed. So who were my grandparents? Poor, young Jewish radicals, communists in the midst of a red scare. And while the evidence against both of them was highly suspect, it was particularly weak against my grandmother, basically boiling down deep from her brother, David Greenglass, and his wife, Ruth, that she had typed Julius's notes and generally supported his efforts. Despite the weakness of that evidence, it really wasn't a match for the concerted effort by the prosecution, politicians, and the mainstream media at the time that really sought to connect the thing that people feared most then, the atomic bomb, with the people they feared most, communists and other radicals. So more than 60 years after my grandparents' execution, there were four key developments that led to the RFC's decision to launch the exoneration campaign. I'm gonna to touch on them briefly, and then I'll share after my talk some links in chat that will provide additional information and references around those and other developments. So first, September of 2008, most of the grand jury testimony in my grandparents' case was released. And that's unusual because usually grand jury testimony is kept confidential. But in this case, a group of historians and organizations, including other um, academic historians as well as journalists, petitioned basically saying that the significant historical nature of the trial meant that that grand jury testimony should be released. And they were successful. The majority of testimony was released. And that included Ruth Greenglass's testimony in which she described writing her own notes based on the information that her husband had allegedly obtained at Los Alamos, but made no mention of Ethel typing those notes. And that was in direct contradiction to her later trial testimony. Six and a half years later in July of 2015, after his death in the intervening years, David Greenglass's grand jury testimony was also released. And one of the organizations that was instrumental in getting the release of that testimony was the National Security Archive. And to quote from their story following the release of David Greenglass's testimony, quote, the grand jury testimony from August 1950 shows Greenglass resisting prosecutors' questions implicating his sister. In one case insisting, Quote, I said before and say it again, honestly, this is a fact. I never spoke to my sister about this at all. So as a result of the release of David Greenglass's testimony, 
About a month later, on August 10th, my dad and uncle, Robert and Michael Mirapol, published an op-ed in the New York Times, basically saying that President Obama should exonerate their mother. And then about a month after that, on what would have been my grandmother's 100th birthday, the New York City Council issued a proclamation with a simultaneous proclamation from the Manhattan Borough Chief. And I'm gonna quote from her proclamation. Now, therefore, I do hereby recognize the injustice suffered by Ethel Rosenberg and her family. And on the occasion of her 100th birthday, proclaim Ethel Rosenberg Day of Justice in the borough of Manhattan. So obviously there was significant organizing and kind of behind the scene efforts that led to both the New York Times op-ed and those joint proclamations from the New York City Council and the Manhattan Borough Chief. And those developments all together really led to my dad and uncle and the Rosenberg Fund for Children launching a campaign asking President Obama to exonerate Ethel Rosenberg. All right, so why did we launch this campaign? I'm sure you can imagine why this was significant and important for my dad and uncle and for our family. But beyond that, we really felt that it was important for the Rosenberg Fund for Children to be involved for a couple of reasons. First, because the release of this new information made it clear that the government understood that Ethel was not a spy, but manufactured a case against her and executed her anyway. And that was really mostly aimed at trying to use her trial and then conviction to force her husband, to force Julius to cooperate. Not to be too grandiose about it, but we felt pretty strongly that that simply doesn't work in a functioning democracy. And that when a government abuses its power against its own citizens in that way, it's really necessary that a government recognize, acknowledge, and do its best to correct its transgressions. And perhaps most importantly for us at the Rosenberg Fund for Children, we really recognize that Ethel's conviction and execution took place at the height of the anti-communist hysteria of the McCarthy era. And when we launched the campaign in 2016, we felt we were experiencing a resurgence of some similar attacks, although this time they were being aimed at Muslims, at immigrants, at transgender people, as well as at Black Lives Matters activists, environmental activists, and others challenging the status quo. So in other words, we felt strongly that the exoneration effort was not just about correcting the historical record, which was significant in and of itself, but also had important implications and lessons for current governmental abuse of power and might be really important for the activists, targeted activists and their families who we work with today. So what did we do? What was the exoneration campaign? We apparently pulled out an oldie but goodie, referring back to what Dean mentioned about early efforts to save my grandparents with a petition campaign. So we launched a petition effort um, seeking first to engage current RFC supporters and folks who had supported my grandparents in the 50s and beyond, and then expanding out to a broad educational effort that really wanted to seek to educate the public about the key facts in my grandparents' case. And we were, as I said, especially focused on governmental abuse of power, particularly against progressive activists and dissidents, and how that continues to impact those individuals, their families, and really threaten those who are seeking to change the status quo. So we launched that petition campaign, um, less so with paper petitions and more using current technology, having a petition on the RFC's website, and then also through partnerships with change.org, moveon.org, Roots Action, all of them kind of partnering with us to help spread the word about that campaign. We also tabled with um, both an opportunity to sign online 
and also to sign hard copies of the petition at a variety of venues and events, which might be familiar for some folks with us this morning, um, at Left Forum, at the new SDS conference, at World Fellowship, National Lawyers Guild Convention, at an art and activism festival at Camp Kinderland. We also encourage folks who sign the petition to share the petition via email and on social media to basically help spread the word to their friends and colleagues who might be interested in learning more about our efforts. So all of that was really the more grassroots part of our campaign. And then we simultaneously reached out to, and had a real media campaign. Um, there had been a production on what ended up being a special double segment on with Anderson Cooper on 60 Minutes interviewing my dad and uncle about their parents, the case, and what how they had been active um, in the ensuing years. That had been in the works for a while, but it was embargoed until it was completed and until 60 Minutes had scheduled that showing. So that eventually aired in October of 2016, and that really helped drive additional attention and interest in the exoneration campaign. And then we also did outreach to other members of the local, regional, and national press um, that led to a full page op ed in the Boston Globe uh, right around Thanksgiving of 2016 in support of exoneration. We also engaged with key influencers, with politicians, public intellectuals, encouraging them to sign the petition, to provide letters or statements of support and then to share the petition and their support of the effort with their followers. And then what ended up being a stroke of brilliance that I take absolutely no credit for, it was actually suggested by one of the consultants working with us on the campaign. On December 1st, 2016, my dad and uncle brought their effort to exonerate their mother to the gates of the White House. Um, with news cameras rolling, they stood on the same spot where they had been photographed in 1953 as six and 10 year old boys. And as children, they had delivered a handwritten letter for President Eisenhower to the guards at the gate asking for clemency for their parents. This time, many decades later, they issued a statement calling on President Obama to exonerate their mother and delivered printed copies of the petitions that had been signed in support of that effort. So what did we accomplish? Because unfortunately, as many of you know, President Obama did not actually sign a proclamation exonerating Ethel. We did, however, um, garner 60,000 signatures on those petitions that we were able to deliver to the White House gates. That was both from current RFC supporters, members of our broader community, as well as a whole bunch of folks who did not know about either the RFC or my grandparents prior to that campaign, but learned about the case through the education effort. There was also extensive media attention that had global reach and pretty remarkably given what had been the really negative bias towards both my grandparents and the case in the past, all of the prominent mainstream news reporting cast the exoneration campaign in a very positive light, including venues that frankly, that was really shocking that that was the way that they were reporting on the effort. NPR's Morning Edition and Here and Now, CBS News, The Washington Post, CNN, Democracy Now!, The Nation, those were among the many national news outlets that did original reporting around the exoneration campaign. Newspapers and radio shows from Canada, England, Israel, Germany, and Australia interviewed my dad and uncle, and an Associated Press article appeared in more than 30,000 newspapers across the country and around the world. So the campaign really was resoundingly successful at changing the narrative about my grandmother and educating the public 
about the dangers of governmental overreach. And as I mentioned in the process, tens of thousands of people learned about the RFC and about the Rosenberg case. So a little bit more about what worked and what didn't and how we might think about that for any future efforts. Um, the right endorsements on social media we learned really matter. So Noam Chomsky or Michael Moore signing the petition and tweeting or sharing that information with their followers, not surprisingly has a sig more significant impact than you or I doing the same. Um, having well po positioned politicians also advocating in support of your effort can really matter. We were very fortunate to have strong support from a number of Massachusetts politicians. Um, our Congressman Jim McGovern was especially supportive of our effort along with his staff. And that was really helpful to us. And we were really grateful for that support. Partnering with change.org and move on and right roots action and other networks and organizations was very helpful both to increase the number of signers on the petition and also to spread the word about the campaign through those networks. And to some extent with petitions, we really did learn that the numbers mattered, that saying more than 50,000 people support this effort had significantly more impact than five or 10 or 20,000 signers might have. A somewhat surprising and frankly, really wonderful realization for those of us at the RFC was how engaged many young people were in the exoneration effort. That was something we had wondered was whether and how we might make a strong connection to current efforts to organize and advocate on behalf of folks who were facing significant targeting in 2016 and to connect that to the exoneration effort and to really show how that was all tied together and not just of historical significance. And a number of young people who got involved in our effort saw it as being connected to their current efforts. And it connected them to us in ways that have continued to benefit, I think, all of us. Um, we found that being at conferences and various festivals was important for making connections, but I wouldn't say that was something where we felt like we had best figured out how to utilize those opportunities to engage the most number of people in the organizing effort. And that's something that I think we will want to really think about um, with the next iteration of exoneration or future campaigns like that. We also found, perhaps not surprisingly, that bringing on good knowledgeable consultants was really key. Having someone who had real experience as a social media organizer and having folks who were skilled at placing stories with the media and really thinking through what might most engage um, different newspapers, different television shows, et cetera, that was enormously helpful to us in our effort. Things that I felt like we didn't kind of entirely successfully figure out and are opportunities for growth or for rethinking or strategizing in the future. Uh, so the canvassing for signatures, we did some of that at events in New York, in Boston, in Massachusetts, and perhaps most successfully um, in DC as part of a anti-death penalty effort there. But that was an area that it felt like we could really increase our effectiveness and outreach and impact. I think we also probably could have done more to engage community organizers and kind of less high profile, but very well connected individuals who might have been able to organize their networks and really help us spread the word about exoneration to folks who would be likely to support the effort. And I think the area that I feel like there was the most, most room for growth or thinking about how to make stronger connections in the future 
was strong connections to the anti-death penalty movement and their networks and those really well-connected and passionate advocates who do really strong and important organizing work across the country. As far as I know, and we did some research on this, so I think we have this right, the US government has never acknowledged wrongfully executing someone. And so we felt strongly that a exoneration, a proclamation that Ethel was wrongfully executed from the highest level of the federal government had an opportunity to be really useful and important, not just for my family or for the RFC, but also for those seeking to abolish capital punishment and those involved in that movement. One other thing that was just a reality of what we were seeking to do and something that I think we'll continue to have to wrestle with is that exoneration doesn't really have a clear, precise path. Um, we did some research, you can Google, there's actually an office and a set of procedures for how you go about requesting presidential pardons or clemency, but that's not what we were looking for. And so figuring out exactly who do you ask for this sort of proclamation or exoneration seemed a little bit murkier. And, you know, as you can imagine, simply sending a letter attached to President Obama or addressed to a President Obama and asking for a proclamation or exoneration is not necessarily going to get in front of the right person at the right time. And so figuring that out is part of the process that's really important. All right, I think there are some questions coming in on chat. I think what we're going to do is hold those questions if that's okay with folks and do that towards the end. And I'm just about to wrap up and then we'll have a fair amount of time for hopefully what will be a robust question and answer and a conversation. All right, so what's next? So I will say in early 2017, after Trump's inauguration, we had what I will admit I found a somewhat confounding phenomenon at the RFC where we got probably a weekly email from someone who had supported the exoneration effort saying, okay, President Obama didn't do this. There's a new administration. What, when are you gonna ask Trump to exonerate Ethel? Which I admit to finding surprising. Um, and I'll be honest and just add that I think my dad and uncle felt pretty strongly that they didn't really want Trump's name on anything having to do with their mother. And that was not an avenue that we were interested in pursuing. Um, I'll also say that just in addition to Trump's politics seeming just categorically at odds with the idea that he would be moved to exonerate my grandmother, his mentor, Roy Cohn, was a key prosecutor in my grandparents' case, and frankly, one of the villains of the story, as far as we all were concerned, having been implicated in alleged prosecutorial misconduct, including some ex parte communications. So the thought that we were going to make our case and that that would somehow, we would be able to do that successfully to a Trump administration seemed highly unlikely to us. But we are, very intrigued by the idea of bringing the exoneration campaign to President Biden. And thankfully, we do have that opportunity to think about. And that's especially kind of um, exciting to us because President Biden is the first president in US history who has publicly expressed opposition to capital punishment. And so thinking about that being an avenue and a way to engage him on this issue seems like it might be really promising to all of us. I think that if we were to relaunch an exoneration effort, we would continue the kind of multi-pronged strategy that felt reasonably successful to us last time, including petition, press coverage, canvassing, engaging with politicians and public intellectuals, as well as supporters, current and kind of potential supporters in a grassroots effort. 
I think also for us recognizing what we kind of reasonably can and cannot accomplish as a, you know, at the RFC as a very small organization who also is committed to our primary mission of providing support for the children of targeted activists, we would really need to think strategically about where to put our financial and human resources and what seems most manageable for us and most likely to be successful. Given the number of times I've said maybe or possibly in talking about what a future exoneration effort might look like, I think um, it's probably pretty clear that we're still exploring what that might look like and what exoneration could possibly be in 2021 or in 2022. I want to encourage everyone who is here with us today to join our mailing list and follow the RSC on social media. You can do that all through our website, which is pretty straightforward. It's rfc.org, and I'll put that in chat as well. And that's where we're really most likely to announce um, first any future efforts around exoneration. And that's also where you can find a bunch of the additional resources that I'm going to share in chat. And hopefully, if we do decide to relaunch an exoneration effort, all of you will engage with us in that process in whatever way works best for you. And we'll really be excited to talk with you more about that if and when we move in that direction. So that's pretty much what I wanted to kind of share as a starting point this morning. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here and listening. And then I'm really happy to take questions and have a conversation with you about this or other questions you might wanna ask me. Thank you so much, Jen. Can everybody hear me? Yes, good. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, such a full message uh, from you. Here I have a basket. This is the moment where we have a, a final song and we also um, put out our popper's uh, hand or our popper's uh, tin cup to say community church needs your support. The more support you can give us, the stronger we will be. We have big plans. We have learned from the COVID experience that uh, this broadcast part of what we do is a, a key important thing for us to be able to reach a lot of people. And we really want to be able to do that along with our physical gatherings and really do it with elegance, grace, and style to be a peace and justice congregation uh, since 1920, 101 years old, and um, to go on boldly into the next century of our, our life here in Copley Square and all over the planet. I wanna end with, uh, or just, just do, a, do this little poem instead of our final song, and then we will open it up to the question and, and answers. This is from the end of a poem by, uh, by Asada Shakur that's called Affirmation. I have been locked by the lawless, handcuffed by the haters, gagged by the greedy, and if I know anything at all, it's that a wall is just a wall, and nothing more at all. It can be broken down. I believe in living. I believe in birth. I believe in the sweat of love and in the fire of truth. And I believe that a lost ship, steered by tired seasick sailors, can still be guided home to port. Asada Shakur. Let's start our question and answer with uh, Karen, who had a, a question. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, let me say also that if you'd like to put a, your question in the chat, that would be fine, and we will re read the question to, to Jen. Karen, are you there with Charlie, maybe? Uh, she put it in the chat. She was asking about uh, her uh, adopted grandfather, father, Abe Maripol, and he wrote this song, Strange Fruit or the poem Strange Fruit, which is adapted into a song and made famous by Billie Holiday. If she could talk about that and in relation to the current Black Lives Movement and uh, mass action against police brutality. Yes, so the, the kind of um, juxtaposition of multiple historical strands kind of in my family where um, my dad and uncle, after their parents, Ethel and Julius, were killed, were adopted by 
Abel and Ann Mirapol. Um, Abel was a high school English teacher who was also a songwriter and his most, one of his most famous songs, um, Strange Fruit, which he originally wrote as a poem that I believe was entitled Bitter Fruit. And he then changed it to a song, Strange Fruit, which um, was made most famous by Billie Holiday and then adopted by and kind of re-recorded by many, many artists since then um, and has had a significant resurgence in the last few decades and particularly in the last handful of years as an kind of anthem in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and been reimagined um, and re-recorded by those organizing against um, police brutality and mass incarceration. And so that, that kind of combination of the, you know, my dad has talked and written about his parents' case in some ways being a legal lynching and then having his adoptive father see, I believe, a famous photograph of a lynching and be so moved and so horrified by what he saw that it stuck with him and years later he wrote this poem that became the song. Amazing, phenomenal, landmark song for social justice. Leonard. Hello, Jen. Go ahead, Leonard. Hello. Good to see you. I think the, the first and maybe the last time I saw you was at the uh, memorial in Ardsley, New York for Abel in December of 1986, yeah. which was a very inspiring uh, event. And it inspired many things. It inspired uh, this cantata, We Are Innocent, based on the, the death house letters of your grandparents, which my, which is a, which is a cherished heirloom from my parents. And um, it also inspired uh, this CD in uh, for Abel Maripol Centennial. No, Abel, a Abel's most famous song was, as you know, Strange Fruit. His second most famous was The House I Live In, written with uh, Earl Robinson, which uh, I had the great honor of honoring in, in his centennial as part of the National Committee to Reopen the Rosenberg case, the last uh, event that I did with them at Local 802 for uh, uh, Earl's uh, centennial. And Abel collaborated not only with Earl Robinson, but with many composers, with Ellie Siegmeister, who was my teacher, and with Kurt Weil, and uh, Herbert Haufrecht, and, and uh, uh, Lehman Engel, and Robert Kirka. Um, he was the librettist for one of the great American operas, The, the Good Soldier Schweik. Uh, so Abel was a, really quite an amazing uh, creative uh, person. I want to talk with you about uh, Ethel and Julius, because um, one of the things that I did when, when I was on the uh, uh, board of, of the National Committee to Reopen the Rosenberg case with your father, um, I was very proud that we got this book published, Final Verdict, uh, which was a sequel to and an antidote to the mistakes of uh, Invitation to an Inquest by Walter and Miriam Schneer. I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, the Schneers actually distanced themselves from the National Committee to Reopen the Rosenberg case for a while, and I brought them back through personal connections because Walter Schneer's sister dated my father. <laughs> when, when dad was in, uh, he was younger than she, but he was in college and she was in high school. So there was that connection and they came back uh, for him and for me. And uh, it was a very fruitful collaboration. I, I adore Miriam and, and the late Walter. And this is a very important book, which basically established um, not only that Ethel was completely innocent, which we all, almost knew even uh, from the, uh, Rosenberg file uh, 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 book uh, earlier, uh, but that your grandparents were not guilty of atomic espionage. This uh, and, and so when they said that they were innocent, they meant it. They were innocent of atomic espionage, which was the crime that they were being charged with. They were charging, being charged with conspiracy, but it was atomic espionage. David and Ruth Greenglass were, in fact, as we learned only recently, low-level spies. But your parents, your grandparents were not. Uh, that is to say, Julius was a spy, but not for atomic things. So that's, I understand. And in fact, when we talked about this years ago, about the, the, the idea of perhaps uh, working for the exoneration of Ethel and putting Julius aside for the moment because he was not innocent of espionage, although he was innocent of atomic espionage. But I want to remind you 
that this cantata, which by the way was premiered at Community Church, this is a poster uh, from June, July, uh, June 1988, when it was premiered at Community Church of New York. And it was also done at Community Church of Boston on December 11th, 1988. That was the first of many wonderful performances we enjoyed doing there. Um, I, the climax of that cantata is when Helene, who was singing Ethel Rosenberg says, I, my husband is innocent as I am myself and no power on earth will, shall divide us in life or in death. I, I, I can never hear that without tears. I mean, it, she, she really felt that she was united with your, your uh, grandfather in life or in death and to separate the, the issues and say, well, we should exonerate him and forget about him. I think there's a danger in that. I mean, there's, there's a, a it's, it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting strategy, um, and a strategy. But don't forget about Julius. That's all I'm, I want to plead with you to, to say. Okay. No, thank you. I think that's an important. You know, that is something that we have thought about and talked about, and it's certainly um, a concern shared by a number of members of our community, and I think an important and valid one. And there's the, there's the kind of what you think you would most like to do and what you think you're, what the kind of strategy is and what you think might be possible. And I also think that there really was a, a real interest in kind of reclaiming Ethel as her own person, not entirely separating her from her husband, but thinking about who was she as an individual in addition to being part of a couple that particularly kind of post second wave feminism was something that a number of us were really interested in thinking about. And the evidence post grand jury, release of grand jury testimony was just so straightforward and overwhelming around Ethel in particular that that felt like an opportunity to really focus on her for a moment without saying, let's forget about Julius, but really thinking about how do we focus some attention on Ethel? But I, I, think I see that T.B. Brooks is on this call and she uh, uh, was on the committee after I retired from it. And yeah. I wonder if she has anything to say, because I haven't heard very much from the, the committee, all the other organizations, a move on I've been working on, side your petition through move on. Um, but uh, the NCRRC has been relatively quiet and I wonder if there's any activity to speak of about that or if you or, or, or T.B. want to talk about it. Is, is that person with us? Well, let's, let's I, see if I, we I can- I saw that she was, Tibby Brooks uh, with a picture of a cat. But, let's uh, see if we can uh, contact her. And meanwhile, um, here's, here's a really interesting observation from, from Pierre from France. Julius was spying for an ally country. That really says, it says it all, and it says um, <clears throat> to me the, the the times and the and the McCarthyite thing was what made this case happen more than anything. And I, I I say that to to bring it to the present. I've I have recently read a book about the Holy Land Foundation Five. This is a. Uh, uh, a situation that seems very akin, not only to Sacco and Vanzetti, but to the Rosenbergs, and it's right now. It's five very successful um, businessmen from Palestine who were in the aftermath of 9-11 prosecuted for a foundation they had put together to, uh, to support children and child welfare in Gaza. And they were pegged as, as horrible terrorists, and they are now all spending enormous long sentences in federal prisons. And um, I, it's not my decision, but I want to advocate for them to be our uh, maybe next Sequin Vanzetti Award winners. I saw a, um, a, a, <clears throat> a webinar with, with Miko Peled uh, and, and uh, the children of some of some of the children of, of these, these men. Uh, it was the most moving thing I have ever seen, and I uh, urge you all to, 
to have a look at it. It's 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 called um, <clears throat> probably in, on YouTube. You look for the Holy Land Foundation Five and Miko Pillad, and you can find this webinar with with these these children. It's it, it speaks to the Islamophobia that was just so so huge it, and Arabophobia at that moment in time in the you know in the aftermath of of 9/11. I got to say that because it's been on my mind a lot. And uh, Jen, uh, it's it's posed as as just a. Do you know about this case? And and do. what do you think? Is it is it similar, or is there are there parallels? I think there are parallels. Um, it's certainly a case I know about. There's a wonderful um, organization. I believe it's the Coalition for Civil Freedoms that's been very involved in pushing back and supporting a number of the individuals and the families who have been targeted um, mostly with kind of and prosecuted as terrorists or providing material support for terrorism post 9-11. Um, and they've done a lot of organizing and support for those individuals as well as their loved ones. Um, my, my father made the connection, I think, in the, the kind of early years after 9-11 that if you were to take his parents' case and take that kind of um, equation that I had mentioned earlier of connecting the thing people feared the most with the people they feared the most, which in the in my grandparents' case was the atomic bomb and communism, and kind of brought that into post 9-11 US, it, there was a similar connection that was deliberately made between people who at that point were most feared which was Muslims and the thing that was most feared, which was terrorism. And so there was this kind of, you know, broad kind of painting of all individuals with a similar brush that made it much easier to prosecute individuals kind of um, through guilt by association and resulted in, you know, what from my perspective, are many wrongful convictions that continue to impact both individuals and their families. Thank you, Jen. Um, uh, Tilly Teixeira, our senior, uh, most beloved member of Community Church, has her hand up. Would you unmute for us, Tilly, and say hello? And, and you might have questions with your historical perspective. Um, okay. Uh, no, I've been following uh, the case, um, but I just have a little extra piece of insight for you on this whole question of exoneration or not, and who did what. I was living with my cousin, uh, Millie, in uh, 1952. Oh, by the way, she's dead. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, we were having difficulties about some of my political activities, and she said, yes, I'll give you money. Uh, don't you use it for politics. I will give you money for defense. Okay? Millie had been in the party uh, contemporary with uh, your grandmother, let's put it that way, and um, very active in the 30s and during the war. She had a, I don't know what, it was some sort of a classified job, but what she told me was that she had been approached to do something, and she said, no way. And this was, uh, you know, this was, uh, she's all for the war effort and supporting the Russians and the Russian front, blah, 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 blah. But no, you know, that was not uh, her uh, political thing. But I'm just saying that putting that in context that that was happening to other people. And, you know, she told me, you know, this is of course of mourning or whatever. But for her to say that at that point in time, and now I'm talking the spring of 53, uh, just take that and, you know, and she was talking about World War II. So that, um, and I guess my piece is that we take it commonly and my own feeling is that, yes, any of the powers are gonna pursue espionage, okay? It's a given, and I don't care who you support. And Lord knows what we think about what our own country is doing and has done in other countries, you know? But that that's separate from politics. As my old boss uh, said to me, uh, 
uh, when we're talking about um, when my husband was called up for subversive activities, uh, is he a is he a spy or is he political? <laughs> And uh, that's my philosophy. But I wanted to say that she wasn't, you know, that uh, your grandparents were not the only ones. And this was a, you know, this, this is life and was life in our country. And good luck. And yes, yeah, I will send you a check. Believe me, I have done so in the past. And uh, I had a uh, communication and it's on my to-do list. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your perspective. That's really helpful. Very easy to remember, rfc.org. No, 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 I haven't. <laughs> no, I'm telling people, <laughs> My go to that <laughs> website and, and donate generously. So, uh, Jen? Um, yes, so I'm seeing a few more questions here. Um, there's a question about what part did anti-Semitism play and then receiving a fair trial and the conviction and execution? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think it absolutely played a role. Um, my, my kind of best sense of this, and I kind of take from my dad and uncle on this and kind of agree with their perspective that that had an enormous impact on the death sentence and on the execution happening, that that's perhaps most where it had an impact. Um, I did some research for my undergraduate thesis on my grandmother that involved interviewing some folks who were involved in the support efforts um, in the early 50s. And one of them shared a story about reaching out to um, kind of very well connected, um, mostly Jewish families in the New York City area, trying to get them to support, to provide support for the efforts around both supporting my grandparents and kind of responding um, first before the conviction and then after. And she shared that the general response she received from folks was an enormous amount of fear that, that part of what might come out of the prosecution was a connection in the kind of popular, you know, it, um, both in the media and also in the general public of Jews with spies. And particularly in the not too long aftermath of the Holocaust, there was an enormous amount of fear of what that might mean for Jews in the US and particularly for those who were progressives or radicals. So I think anti-Semitism really did play a role. Um, there's also, and as someone just said, so you had kind of Jews involved in the case in terms of the prosecution, in terms of the judge, you did not have, and this is interesting given that it was a jury in New York City, you did not have Jews on the jury. And so having them around the case, but not deciding, not involved in jury deliberations, is another piece of the case. All right, so I think we have another- I see that Tibby uh, yeah. has her hand up and she has a beautiful kitty cat there, uh, just the same color as our kitty cat. I thought it was my wife for a minute there. Tibby, um, would you like to join us? Uh, yeah, I would like to respond to Leonard Lehrman's query. Hi, Tibby. Uh, the, yes. the National Committee to Reopen the Rosenberg case of which I was the executive director, was closed. It was shut down after we got the New York City Council proclamation. And it was closed down at Robbie's request because it got the proclamation. And the next stage would be to get an exoneration for Ethel. Uh, and of course, I'm much older now than I was when I took over. And I'm an, I no longer organize. It should be done by somebody who's 50 years younger than me, preferably someone of color to make it meaningful. Otherwise, it could be done by a cat. <laughs> if it's done by a cat, I hope it's one that, that gorgeous, just like mine. Thank you, Tibby. <laughs> All orange cats are gorgeous. Go ahead, Leonard. 
Th thank you for the update, Tibby. I didn't know that it had been closed. Uh, we had been fighting for exoneration uh, with David Allman and others uh, when I was uh, co-director with Richard Corey. David is past 102. I mean, how about talking about people who are still functioning? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Somebody you. who's 25 years old. Oh, uh, Leonard? Um, I, I want to change the subject slightly to something that uh, uh, caught my eye a year ago, Jen, when your father wrote about his uh, speaking with Michael Dukakis, who, of course, exonerated the Rosenberg. The, the, he didn't exo he exonerated back on Vanzetti. Uh, back on Vanzetti. I talked with him about exonerating the Rosenberg, and he said, "Well, that's another uh, uh, kettle of fish." But he, uh, the the process that uh, at which, uh, but through which that exoneration was arrived at. It's very important to understand and could be instructive, I think. And I just want to say a little bit about that because um, Mark Blitzstein uh, was writing his magnum opus uh, about Sacco and Vanzetti. And uh, he visited some, some of the legislative hearings uh, that were trying to uh, uh, get the, uh, uh, a pardon or, or, or exoneration or something. And they were quite unsuccessful. Uh, he wrote about them uh, and the chaos that, that was in those uh, hearings in a scene from his opera. After Michael Dukakis exonerated Sacco and Zetti, long after Blitzstein was dead, and I was given the go-ahead to complete the opera, I decided, together with the Blitzstein estate, to cut that scene, because we didn't need to show the chaos. We wanted to show the closure, and we put Michael Dukakis into the opera, for which I was criticized terribly, but uh, supported by the Blitzstein estate and, and others who, who watched the opera. People who didn't watch the opera uh, uh, said otherwise. Anyhow. Um, it was very interesting to me to read when your father said that he uh, that Michael Dukakis had presented him with a copy of that exoneration statement as a model, and it it seems to me that uh, that really is where you need to go to to try to get the exoneration from the top rather than getting uh, committees. Uh, although you, it, it's commendable as, as hell that that the uh, city council uh, and the builder president did uh, issue an exoneration, um, but uh, approaching Joe Biden, I I would I I mean. I don't know what Joe Biden's relationship is to uh, Michael Dukakis. He has a very good relationship with Jimmy Carter, which uh, no other Democrat since Tar Carter has had. But so, I mean, I would think that uh, getting Michael Dukakis and Michael Dukakis is 88 years old. He's, he's still compass Mantis. In fact, he was on a call. I just saw him on, on the call on, on the community church a few uh, months ago. Get, I would suggest that you get him involved and maybe get him uh, to to uh, uh, be among those approaching President Biden. What do you think, Jen? We, we did that. There's a letter of support. So the information, I'm going to post this here again for... All right, give me one second. Let me just copy and paste out of my document here to... All right, so the, um, let's see, exonerate here. What I am gonna do is add one more link. Let me just go find it. Um, part of one of the letters of support that we were able to kind of gather to help augment the exoneration campaign um, was from Dukakis. So there was a kind of engagement with him and recognition, as you said, that his proclamation was a really useful model for exoneration. And I think that's something that we would continue to explore moving forward. Very good. I, 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 um, I want to tell you that I, I, could, I completed Sacco and Vanzetti after I completed We Are Innocent. And I quoted We Are Innocent in Sacco and Vanzetti. So there's, there's a, a, a musical wanna, connection there as well as a political philosophical connection. I want to tell <laughs> folks that all of the, all of these links will be um, on the YouTube channel um, as soon as I get a chance to copy, copy and paste them in. But I also want to make a little correction here, Leonard. It, it wasn't really an exoneration. It was a proclamation saying that they had been unfairly tried and convicted and that, quote, any disgrace should be forever removed from their names. But when I talked to Michael- An official Dukakis, state exoneration. It came he said, he, he said it was that. not a He was not a pardon, it was an exoneration. That's what the words that he used with me. 
I an, think an I official know. exoneration from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or just an exoneration in the opinion of that one governor? It was an exoneration that was part of a proclamation from the governor. Yeah. Uh, but On behalf of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? You see, you see the difference? You know, I, it's like uh, Jen just talked about the, the process of, of an exoneration on the, on the, the federal level. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in a lot of the, uh, the Saquon Vanzetti um, uh, scholarship that uh, I, I'm not familiar with, but I've been around it enough to, to say that there's a lot of discussion about that distinction. Um, some of it is we're, we're going to see a whole lot more of when uh, Bob Dottilio's um, estate uh, is is settled and uh, an enormous treasure trove of Sacquin Vanzetti uh, archival material. Well, Dean, I think comes, the, the comes crucial way. thing is that Michael Dukakis said, I did not pardon them because that would have meant they were guilty. I exonerated them. And that's that's the crucial difference right there. Um, and in, in asking for a pardon from, from uh, uh, President Eisenhower, which was refused, there, the Rosenberg committee was not asking for a pardon, it was asking for exoneration. And uh, not, not from the legislature or, or from the district attorney or, 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 or the uh, attorney general, but from the president. And that, that's where it has to come from, I think. Jen, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think again that that process, you know, that's part of, part of figuring out exactly how you put that in place. And the reality is that if someone's, you know, anyone is, going to parse the language of any of those statements so that it it ends up being interpreted to mean slightly different things to slightly different people. So I think part of that is just recognizing that even when you are successful in getting something like that, a proclamation and exoneration, how it's understood by different folks from different perspectives is going to influence, you know, what that looks and feels like to them. Um, but it certainly is a useful model for us in thinking about the way that we framed our request and for moving forward, what sort of process we might utilize. I am seeing a question that I from chat that I wanted to bring up. Um, so from Daniel saying that Leonard Peltier and Mumia are both still in jail. What are your thoughts on them? Um, I would say that they are among two of among the most high profile examples of what the RFC means when we talk about targeted progressive activists, individuals who, you know, from our perspective, should not have been in prison in the first place and have absolutely been there many, many, many years, if not decades longer than there was any reason for that to have happened. Um, Leonard is on the RFC's advisory board, and we have made grants over the years um, to to his grandchildren and great grandchildren, the kind of you know, one of the ironies of the work that we do that we are simultaneously grateful to have been able to enable him to meet one of his great grandsons in prison and appalled by the fact that he has been in prison long enough to have great grandchildren who he has not met. Um, and for Mumia, my dad mentions the fact that one of the first people who interviewed him in one of the radio interviews that he remembers doing around his parents' case ended with a question by the interviewer of whether my father thought that something like his parents' situation could happen again. And that interviewer was Mumia. Which wow. Talking about things coming full circle in so many difficult and painful ways. I have a question. This is Charlie Welch. Uh, the um, irrespective of how it happened, uh, the uh, the fact that the Soviet Union got a bomb and uh, I think uh, was one of the biggest uh, things that counterbalanced the United States threatened to use nuclear weapons. How many times? I can't even count. One of the first ones I can think of is Dien Bien Phu, where the, they were trying to um, stop the Vietnamese Revolution. And um, the innumerable 
times they would have threatened. And I think what prevented them from doing was the fact that the Soviet Union had a bomb. And um, I don't know if you get into those sorts of questions, but I'd be interested if you do to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, well, I, I think there, I think most people can understand the irony in the only country who has dropped an atomic bomb claiming that no one else has the right to have one. That strikes me as being somewhat obviously, you know, <laughs> illogical. Um, and, you know, I think certainly those who were and the scientific community itself in the 40s and 50s seeing quite clearly that there needed to be checks and balance that any one country having sole ability to utilize a you know devastating weapon was perhaps not in the best interest of an ongoing or sustainable peace i want to um take this opportunity we've been talking about mumia of showing folks this incredible three volume set that we received uh, complimentary we, we've supported the, the 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 struggle to free mumia for a long time it's called murder incorporated uh empire genocide manifest destiny and there's three volumes dreaming of empire forward by chris hedges who was one of our speakers this year america's favorite pastime forward by brian williams who was our sacco vanzetti award winner a couple of years ago and um, finally, Perfecting Tyranny, forward by Angela Davis, who has also spoken at Community Church. So th these are in our library, um, as, as are quite a number of books about the Rosenberg case. Um, and we're trying to sort of turn into a library that has a certain targeted uh, areas of interest. And you just heard a few of them, Sacco and Vanzetti, the Rosenberg case, uh, Mumia. Um, Let's see. Those, I believe those books can be um, obtained from, I think, Prison Radio has been involved, wonderful oh. organization um, has been involved in distribution. That's correct. Um, I, had a, I had a comment. Dor D Dorothy Weitzman, I have a comment. Dorothy, go ahead. Hi. Okay. Um, thank you. Hi. With regard to exoneration and the whole aspect of how people um anyway i wanted to mention that in this state and i think nationwide there's been a, more attention given to pardoning and clemency two processes that are at the state and federal level that can uh, relieve people from from long-term incarceration that's unjust or just too darn long we shouldn't have the life without the degree of life without parole uh sentencing that we have but so i've I observe that in our state, there's there's more education going on, there's more efforts, and it all is quite complicated. You can't, uh, as a governor, just do these things. On the other hand, as a governor, you you are key in pushing ahead. So we we need to have governors, and our governor now is not helpful, and neither was Patrick very good on on pushing any of his power, using any of his powers to pardon people. And I myself am still a little vague, but I I could tell. Anyone who was very interested, there's, there's programs coming up, educational programs, and Jean Trostein, who's spoken to us, is publicizing it through something that, an email that I'm on and Dean's on, a program coming up on clemency in this state. Thank you. Thank you. There's... Um, I'll also add, since Dean mentioned kind of the books and um, Community Church of Boston's seeking to become a resource and kind of repository of information, that's something that we've made some efforts to do at the RFC. Um, we're close to, I'm not going to give a date because if I give a date, we won't meet it. So I'll just say close and you can interpret for yourself what that means to launching a new version of our website that will include a Rosenberg case section with a case timeline of key dates and links to additional resources, as well as since um, it was one of the first questions that I answered today, a whole section of that website on strange fruit and a separate section on art and activism, since that has been so kind of instrumental to the history of my grandparents' case and the way that individuals have kind of sought to support and to share information about 
the case and educate the broader public, art and artists have been really important in that process in so many ways over the decades. Jen, you are referring, I think, to yes. Art and the Rosenbergs uh, exhibit that Rob Oaken did use years ago, which is very important and very good. But I hope you won't exclude other things that were done in the name of the NCRRC over. Oh years. yeah, there'll be it'll be a whole kind of kind of combination of resources and links. And I think one of the things that I believe is on that page is a request for folks to come across other pieces of art or artwork to send them to us so that we can make sure they're included. Should it go directly to you or to the RFC in general? Um, I think once we launch that site, it'll there'll be a kind of a little opportunity. There'll be something on the website that will give you an opportunity to share additional info. But doing that through RFC.org should be the easiest way to do so. I'll be very happy to do that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well. This has been such a rich conversation and uh, such food for community church thought, and it's just great to have you back. Jen Mirapol and all of you folks who, who, uh, whose names I don't know, uh, welcome to Community Church. If you ever feel like stopping in, um, uh, you're, you're not... Um, you're not doing anything on a Sunday morning. You can still be in your pajamas and still uh, join us over coffee and, and uh, bagels or whatever it is you do. Um, we will be here at 11 a.m. Uh, on Sunday. We will take off some uh, civilized summertime. But on the other hand, there's all these programs, possibilities that, that come in and, and we want to do them sooner than later. And so we might be doing a few things in the summertime as well. Um, Please uh, uh, send an email to our office manager, comchurch at gmail.com, and uh, give us your email address. We'd be glad to add you to our list. Uh, we send out two or three emails a week give, giving reminders of different things that we're, that we're hosting or that we're supporting, uh, different uh, simpatico organizations nearby, like Muslims for Progressive Values, or like Theater Offensive, LGBT theater uh, group, or like Mass Peace Action. Um, we have, we're trying to put together an umbrella group that, that does publicity together and that gets the word out uh, to, to everybody. Um, Dean, could you just mention, I just want to mention- Leonard, two, go ahead, please. You, you, had, you had asked earlier if we wanted to remember people, and there are two particular people I want to remember very warmly and uh, fondly in conjunction with the Rosenberg case and uh, with Community Church of Boston. Uh, Aaron Katz, uh, who was in Israel when the case uh, uh, broke and, and detected the anti-Semitism involved and founded the, the National Committee to reopen the Rosenberg case, and Sue Koritz. Do you remember Sue Koritz? She of was course. Very, very, you do. She was a friend of my parents before I was born, long before I was born, and she was the one that brought us to the church in 1988. And we Very remember. important member of this congregation and um, uh, of, of fond memory, uh, president of the congregation for, for several years and, and deeply involved on the, on the board, Sarah Sue Koritz Presente. Thank you. That's what we say. Um, another one I would like to remember is named uh, Eugene Glickman, who uh, Leonard and I know from music circles, Gene Glickman, uh, uh, who uh, was a choral arranger in, in the New York area and also um, a, a choral director. And um, uh, and he had a connection to this also. I want to tell you, I, uh, Edith Siegel sent me to Gene Glickman, who was running a, a group called Four Parts of the Movement, which also incorporated a group called Woman's Song. And his uh, Woman's Song and Four Parts of the Movement formed the basis of the Metropolitan Philharmonic Chorus, which then premiered the Rosenberg Cantata. So there's, there's, there's Gene Glickman's direct connection to everything we're talking about today. Well, let's uh, finish out by uh, maybe unmuting so we can give a, a big round of applause to Jen Mirapol and the Rosenberg Fund for Children. It's just such a enormous, fabulous work that y'all yeah. do out there. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to close out with a lovely E.E. E. Cummings poem that I love in, in this time of the, the summer when all is in bloom and full outburst of green. This is what E.E. E. Cummings says. I thank you, God, for this 
amazing most day for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes! I who have died am alive again today and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and of love and wings and of the gay great happening illim Im illimitably, whoa, that's a mouthful, earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing any lifted from the know of all nothing human merely being doubt unimaginable you? Now the ears of my ears awake and now the eyes of my eyes are opened. I had another one I was gonna read by that, but I lost it. So unless there's reason to continue, uh, we will say goodbye to everybody. Um, Bye. And say, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen, hallelujah, amen, 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 see you next week, amen, hallelujah, amen, 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 amen. amen. Jen, did you have one other thing to say by any chance? I just or wanted just to thank you and thank the, you know, the church and everyone for being here today. I really enjoyed it, and I'm so grateful for this commemoration that you do to remember my grandparents. So thank you for everyone to, for being part of it today. You're welcome. Thank you. And don't forget, folks, Wednesday at 3 p.m. on the same link or in person here in the auditorium, you are encouraged to wear a mask and you're encouraged, if able, to be vaccinated as well. But if not, you can join us virtually and we are going to proudly grant the Sacco and Vanzetti Award to Julian Assange. And next Sunday, a program on Central America. The Sunday after that, a program on Stephen Donziger. And one last pitch, June 25, on this same link, 7 p.m., it's a Friday night, will be a concert by this guy named Dean Stevens. Uh, that would be me, yours truly. A uh, bunch of new songs to, to share with you. And uh, an opener, a uh, beautiful uh, friend of mine named Teresa Tuduri, wonderful, crazy, uh, crazy woman and high, pe high priestess of song from New Mexico, Teresa Tuduri and Dean Stevens, June 25th, 3 p.m. Amen. <laughs> Amen, 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 hallelujah. Bye, everybody. Bye.